In his 1996 essay, Brain Books, Bob Wilson listed the top 10 books he wished everyone would read. Second on the list was The Cantos by Ezra Pound. Bob writes, and that means getting to the last page. You may give up on some pages and say, I'll never figure this stuff out, but keep going until you get to the last page. Pound offers something no other writer except Dante has ever attempted. Pound offers a hierarchy of values. We've heard so many voices from the East telling us all is one, and we've got so many puritanical dualists of all sorts telling us, no, there's good and bad. And they all define those terms in their own way. Against this monoism and dualism, Pound offers a hierarchy of values in which he gives you a panoramic picture of human history, very much like Griffin's intolerance. Only in it, Pound shows levels of awareness levels of civilization, levels of ethics, and levels of lack of all of these things. And you realize that you have a hierarchy of values too, but you've never perfectly articulated it. Welcome to another episode of the Hilaritas Podcast. I am your host, Mike Gathers. Join me as we explore the vast world of iconic writer, psychedelic psychologist, rebel philosopher, and self-proclaimed agnostic mystic, Robert Anton Wilson. Visit us at hilaritaspress.com slash podcast for show notes, links, and past episodes. In this episode, I discuss the poet and critic Ezra Pound with returning guest Eric Wagner. All right, so let's make it official. And and I'm just going to, despite making it official, I want to keep it casual because you threw me off guard last time with some questions for me. And I I, I thought, well, I need to take this less seriously. But I was... (laughs) I was thinking about we would have first encountered each other on alt.fan.ra Wilson. And in my mind, that would have been late 99 when I might have shown up and it might have taken me a while to start posting much. I don't know. But what I realized is, is why the hell would I even think to be on there? And when I was in college in the early 90s, we would go to rec.music.gdead. And we get set lists the day out, you know, somebody would post a set list by the next morning and uh, tape trading and and tape trading trees and all of that. And that was kind of my early internet experience, I guess, as well. But that got me into the, the world of Usenet. And then Michael Johnson, I guess, allegedly just uh, emailed AOL and said, hey, how come there's not a group for this guy? I think he's important. And then... Uh, Alt.fan.ra Wilson was created, I guess, by OLL. And I don't think I took too much longer before I found it. How did you find it? Just through AOL? And I think Mike, somebody let Bob Wilson know. And okay. Wilson sent out an email about it. And so I went on. Ah. I, think, I think that's as I recollect it. So my guess is that I'm not sure if Michael let Bob know or somebody let Bob know. You know, because it may be Rasa. I mean, because Bob had a lot of friends who were very tech savvy. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and for some reason, two little things pop up right away. One, it, it, there's always a Grateful Dead connection. You know, Stuart Brand <laughs> of the Merry Pranksters. Yeah, yeah. In the Whole Earth Catalog, I forget which one. It may have been the next Whole Earth Catalog. He wrote a review of ABC of Reading by Pound. He oh, said, wow. in high school, I learned to hate literature. In college, I learned to hate it in French. Ezra Pound, where were you when I needed you? Oh, wow. That, so it's fun. Boy, I want to talk about tech savvy Bob. And uh, when I was gathering my mind for this, I was like, I have never been able to make heads or tails of the cantos. But I did crack into the guide to, what is it? Guide to culture. Guide to culture. This, yeah, I thought, oh, well, this is a great book. And then I put it down after about 50 pages and never picked it up again. 
And I also have a copy of the ABC of reading. And uh, yeah, so that's where Ezra Pound is like accessible to me. Amen. And, and, and it's interesting too, I, I, thinking about tech around, oh man, 98, there was a thing called the Open City Auditorium online. Mm-hmm. And they asked Bob Wilson to put together a, a Ezra Pound group. So he contacted me and said, do you want to do do this with me and we did it for a few months there was a third guy named eric something but years passed i wanted to get back in and access it i couldn't remember my password the website had gone out of business it was still up and i was like contacted their webmaster just i would need a password to get in because bob wrote some really interesting stuff in there uh and now i can't even find it so it's gone so i'd like have tried this so this is like that's 24 years ago 20, it was 24 and a half because it was before I was even teaching. I was working at Blockbuster back then. Oh, wow. But I, it was it was really it was really sort of cool because, you know, Bob would occasionally pull me into Poundian things, you know, because as, as you said, you know, I had very similar experiences with, with those two books. First started reading Bob Wilson 40 years ago and about 39 and a half years ago, I bought ABC of Reading, loved it for a few pages. Then he started quoting Chaucer in Middle English, and I gave up. <laughs> then summer of 83, I got Guide to Culture out of the library, loved it, and became obsessed by Pound. Then every few years, I would like be disgusted by it, get tired of it, et cetera, keep coming back, learning new things. Another tech problem around, oh, 99, I was frustrated with Pound, and Bob said, I tell you what, Ask me any 10 questions about Ezra Pound, and I'll answer them. So we had this email exchange. Really good one, I thought. And updated AOL, and it deleted all my old emails and all my saved emails. And so that's gone forever. Except as I vaguely remember. Right. I remember the conversation you were talking. No, I remember that conversation you were originally talking about. Because I had stumbled onto it at one point. And I almost wonder if I save part of it, but it would be deep in the, the the catacombs of some hard drive. What strikes me, I remember Bob giving me a hard time because I was questioning some of Pound's ethics about how he treated women. And, you know, because for years and years and years, he was married, but he would like his, he would see his mistress a few days a week, but a few days a week with his wife. And right. Bob was like, oh man, you remind me of St. Paul. You're such a moralist. You know, it worked for them. Uh, uh, and, and I, 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 it made me think, especially listening to you and Oz, Bob was very good at accepting people. Yeah. He would take some really problematic people and he would not get bent out of shape by their effed up stuff. Thinking about Alistair Crowley and Ezra Pound. You know, Pound, he just horrifies me sometimes, says some terrible things. And that's one of the reasons I sort of go to him and come back. But he also had incredible perception about poetry. And Pound could be incredibly generous. Mm. And so w- w- one of the things, and, and Bob talked about this, Pound believed writers help keep the language in a good condition. If we have good writers, we'll have a better civilization. Very sort of Confucian notion. Hmm. So Pound had very good taste, and he would notice these young writers with tremendous ability. And then he would work so hard to get them published and get them money. So there's some people say we probably we may not have had the career of T.S. Eliot or the career of James Joyce or the career of Robert Frost or the career of E.E. E. Cummings or Ernest Hemingway without Pounds helping them both with actual advice and with really fighting to get them recognition and getting them funding, especially funding in the case of Eliot and Joyce. And so for all Pounds effed up understanding of so many things in the world and his horrible anti-Semitism and general racism and just hatred sometimes, he did work so hard to get these people a voice and establish, you know, especially Elliot and Joyce so much. Uh, and, and, And I think about oftentimes artists are very myopic. They want to do what they want to do. Uh, and, And I think about the parallel situation of the first generation romantic composers in Europe. Um, Chopin was about Chopin. Schumann was a little weird, mostly about himself. Liszt 
was so generous. He championed Schumann. He championed Chopin, even though they did not have much interest in his music. And that's the same thing that you see with Uncle Ezra, that mm. he really fought to establish Joyce and Elliot's careers. Joyce valued his friendship, valued his support. Joyce had very little interest in, in Pound's creative work. Elliot appreciated, you know, Ezra's work, although, you know, he, he was he was not as generous a spirit, I don't think. So maybe, if could you detail what it is, the hang-ups people have about Pound? I, I had a bit of a conversation with Bobby Campbell about this, and I'm, but um, I've just been found him mostly incomprehensible. This tale of the tribe, the cantos, I, mm -hmm. I don't get it. It's not my my thing. Well, let me go. Let me I'm, before we go there. Let me. I'm going to quote. It's the Brain Books article that you know so well because you typed it up, I believe, and uh, I posted it on the the fans website. Everybody should struggle as much as they can with the Cantos by Ezra Pound. That means getting to the last page. You may give up on some pages and say, "I'll never figure this stuff out," but keep going till you get to the last page. And here it is. Pound offers something no other writer except Dante has ever attempted, and Dante is just not relevant. Well, I, I went off script. And Dante does it in an evil way that doesn't mean much to modern people. Pound offers a hierarchy of values. And I, it goes on to describe that. So I guess I'm uh, going two different directions. But to set the stage, that's what I, from Wilson, I'm like, oh, the hierarchy of values. Now, um, now that I've twisted this around, what is it that people, what's the hang up with Pound? You mentioned some of it. What goes specific, like anti-Semitism? Yeah, so Pound is a teenager who decides he wants to know more, more about poetry than anybody else on earth by the age of 30. Okay. He pursues this aggressively. He learns bits of a lot of different languages. Now, so there are some people who fault Pound's scholarship. But he did not learn French, Latin, and Greek to be a professor. He learned them so that he could read and appreciate poetry in those languages. Okay. And so he worked very hard to be able to appreciate what he thought were the best poems in a bunch of different languages, especially he was working in his bachelor's degree, I think, in romance languages, working on his master's so he was kicked out. He was kicked out for having a young lady in his room during a, a rainstorm uh, event against the rules. I, and again, so much of this stuff I read 40 years ago. So my, I may have little factual errors here. This is the general gist of it. Um, he had, a again, education 100 years ago. He had a grounding in Latin, French, German, Spanish, Italian. He worked hard at learning Provençal and Anglo-Saxon, some Greek. Okay, and that's basically where he's, he's approaching this. Uh, he thought that the best living writer of poetry in English was Yeats. He went to go study with Yeats. So at the time he was 30, which is 1915. He has really understood a lot of the Western European poetic tradition. This is right when World War I happens. Uh, a, a key book is The Pound Era by Hugh Kenner, which really mm -hmm. looks at him, Joyce, Eliot, uh, William Carlos Williams, all these different people. Uh, I know when I was working on my master's thesis on Wilson and Joyce, Bob recommended reading The Pound Era for understanding his take on Joyce. And again, you can get Michael Johnson to talk about this. He, he, he's he, he's be great. I wish you were here today. Pound I mean, Pound has friends who die in the war, especially the young sculptor Goje Bresca. And so he's sort of he, he's you know the the whole world is is shaken up by World War One so much. In some ways, I think that um, since the scientific revolution in the 18th century, there's this idea that new technology can make things better. Okay, all right. But then we've got World War I with machines, poison gas, airplanes dropping, yeah. bombs. The idea is that all this technology can really destroy things. And Pound sort of says, you know, why, if the Germans have the same civilization that we have, we're all coming out of this great European tradition, why are you trying to kill each other? Pound becomes more and more not just interested in poetry, but what are the causes of war? Mm. And he then makes one of the great mistakes of his life. He thinks, oh, Mussolini has the answer. <laughs> Okay, he says, oh, Mussolini has these economic things. Okay, so serious mistake. I was talking with the poet Pete Fairchild, B.H. Fairchild, 
And he, he made the observation that when you talk about, let's say, Provençal poetry from the late Middle Ages, Pound really, really, really knows his stuff. You know, he had walked over the ground there with T.S. Eliot talking about this is where this, where this poet went. He knew this poetry really well. He had some academic background in the languages. When he was dealing with the stuff that he wrote about in his first nonfiction book, The Spirit of Romance, about late medieval poetry, he really, really, really knew his stuff. As Pound got older, he thought he was an expert in more and more and more things. Yeah. Okay. And he's, you know, and this is where getting ready for you, uh, in this interview, I went back and reread like 100 pages, 150 pages of the Cantos. And there's stuff that's so beautiful, like, oh, I've forgotten the Greek word, Calipagus, great, whatever, whatever. But man, when he starts, when he gets full of hatred, no. Okay, he just sort of dismisses people and he uses this language dismissing other human beings. And you can sort of see where Hitler and Mussolini would appeal to him. When Pound didn't yeah. like you, he would just be so dismissive. And that was in and his so poetry he, in the Cantos. You see that hatred come out? It, it, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's, <laughs> it's, it's, so it's like, um, in 1940, he published the Cantos, uh, which is like uh, the Chinese history Cantos. And he's going a little bit, he's trying to summarize all of Chinese history in 90 pages of poetry. Um, and But he just despised Buddhists and he despised Taoists. And so he starts using these really nasty terms for anybody who gets interested in Buddhism or Taoism. And again, mm. Bob Wilson, in his wonderful forgiving way, said, well, you know, the version of Confucius that Pound liked so much was by somebody who was trying to reunify Taoism and Confucianism. And as you get to the end of Pound's life, there's these very Taoist-like passages. But uh, Pound was a creature of passion, and his passion, when it turned to hatred, was so terrible. Um, so anyway, uh, the poet Don Hall thought Pound had a mental breakdown in the late 30s. Pearl Harbor's attack, America and, and uh, Italy declare war on each other. Pound wants to come back to the United States, but his dad, Homer, is with him in Italy, and his dad's help, he can't be moved. Pound is doing broadcasts for the Italian government. A lot of them about literature, but he's got horrible, horrible, horrible things he says about Jewish people, and he keeps supporting Hitler and Mussolini. Italy loses the war. Again, I've had people who sort of, it's, there's some people have so many different points of view about sort of what actually happened in their history. But Pound turns himself in or is captured, he's put into the detention training center outside of Pisa, which is for prisoners who have been convicted of crimes. So everyone at him there are the mostly soldiers who are rapists and murderers. But he is accused of treason, so he's considered separate. So Pound is a 60-year-old man. No one's allowed to speak to him. He has a mental breakdown, physical breakdown. They put him into the nurse's tent where he writes maybe the greatest poetry of the century, which are called the Pisan Cantos. Mm -hmm. So he's there looking out of his room, seeing people hung. He's in the outhouse when he learns that World War II is over. Um, and he's writing this incredible poetry where he's sort of saying, have I wasted my life? What's the heck going on in this civilization? What's going on in this world? The question is, how much did he know about the Holocaust? Probably very little, but he had been full of this hatred. Yeah. Uh, and it's really interesting to go back and look at, he was friends with the Jewish poet, Louis Zukovsky. And Zukovsky really sort of idolized Pound. But you can read these things about Zukovsky. So, so Zukovsky realized very early about the absolute horrors of the Nazis. And him dealing with Pound's horrible anti-Semitic sayings is sort of interesting and sobering to look at. Um, have I answered your question or I can just keep going? Well, no, let's pause for a second here. I think I think you've answered or I'm I'm getting the gist. I mean, what I'm hearing is that if he were alive today, he'd probably be a, a card carrying red hat MAGA Trumper. No? No. I, no the he, nationalism and the uh I don't fascism. He's always his own guy. And he for me, he gets more and more interesting as he gets older, as he's broken. Mm-hmm. But okay, I guess so, I'm just saying in terms of being a, a anti-Semitic and a supporter of Mussolini and Hitler, maybe I'm going but, a little too broad here. Or we're comparing him to your average MAGA hat Trumper. He, he's, he is not your average. Do you he, think he would support Trump? 
the way he supported Hitler? I have no idea. I have, I have no idea. I, okay. I remember talking with Pound's daughter and about who said Pound was not anti-Semitic. Pound had Jewish friends. He again is it's weird and twisted. He said, and I'm thinking it's whether he got out when he got out of the a, a, a asylum or in the asylum, he said, My life was ruined by my stupid suburban anti-Semitism. Wow. So he realized that he was wrong. Uh, and for me, it's interesting. At the end of his life, he basically went into silence and barely spoke for the last like nine years of his life. There are people like Allen Ginsberg who see him as being like this Sufi saint going into silence. There are people like Don Hall who see him as basically mentally ill. I love there's a story. Ginsberg went to go visit him in the late 60s in Italy. And he played him Dylan and the Beatles. And Pound didn't say anything. And Ginsberg turned to his mistress, Olga Rudge, and he said, you know, does he like it? And she said, well, if he didn't, he would leave. But for me, it's great because you've got Dylan and Ginsburg Pound, who knew Yates going back through generations. This is like the whole history of Western civilization there with right. Ginsburg playing this little LP of Sergeant Pepper and whatever right. Dylan album he brought. But if you could, and this is something, those little things he wrote his last nine years are so heartbreakingly beautiful. Okay. Mm -hmm. So for instance, so he was silent, pro, but he kept writing. Very little, very, very little. He'd like write two or three sentences. But wow. sometimes they're just so wonderful. So like they put together his selected prose and he said, re usura, I was out of focus. The problem is avarice. So he's weird. In some ways, he sounds like Elizabeth Warren. <laughs> it's a green green that is, nest, you know, you know, he, he, he's definitely economically his own guy. Yeah. Um, and then. Um, well, let's hold that thought just for a second, maybe because okay. and, and, I was. We don't want to go down the 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 red hat maggot trumper road. I just was comparing the anti semitism and, and that kind of. I think that period of time between World War One and World War Two is very similar to the period of time we're in now, and uh, where nationalism and populism are becoming a big thing, and uh, that's why I was drawing a comparison with with Trump, but. Um, in terms of the original question, where like where does all the the controversy around pound come from? Uh, what I'm hearing is this this expression of hatred, and um, part of me almost admires that because it's honest, and I think a lot of us carry that hatred within us, but it, we bury it really deeply, and and just to hear somebody let it rip um, is refreshing in a way. Uh, and, and I can hear you go. <laughs> well, and that's one of the things that Ginsburg valued about him. He said, mm. Ginsburg said that Pound is the first person to put his whole life down on paper. Ah. One of the things that came out as, as, uh, is that say T.S. Eliot's were paper, letters were published. Eliot had a lot of the same anti-Semitic views as Pound, not as virulent, but he didn't say it publicly. Um, from from a Wilsonian perspective, if you think about the whole jumping Jesus phenomena, Pound is the first person, the first generation. He enjoys both, but Pound lived so much longer that he lived through information doublings. Mm. So he's born in 1885. I believe his father or his grandfather was the first white person born in Idaho. Okay. So he grows up in a world of Henry James. Okay. He lives through two world wars, seeing somebody walk on the moon and seeing so much lost, okay, as well as the things gained, but sort of saying, what, what is there still for us to value? And, and, and it, it, it's interesting to me, even though I have not been an active Poundian for years, uh, I have kept teaching his books in certain classes. And they still seem to work despite him being so problematic. In which books would you say? Um, like, again, we well, go back for to us, reading and guide to culture, the, the culture. Those seem like good, good, wholesome well, books. And, and, and for somebody who wants to see why is, Ezra can be so charismatic and so funny. In the book, Literary Essays, there's an essay called How to Read, which is like an earlier version of ABC of Reading. It's under 100 pages long. 
that somebody might enjoy. Um, mm-hmm. But I would use, he put in an anthology while he was in the mental hospital called Confucius to Cummings. Yeah. It seems to me the best single vol- volume anthology of poetry in English that's out there. And I used that for college freshman English classes, oh, for five years. And so I did it like um, at least 10 classes using that. And it seemed to work really well. And, and, and what I think about McLuhan talked about that we're in a post-literate world. We're in a world no longer dominated by books. Those people who read books, overwhelmingly, if they're going to read works of art, they're going to read fiction, not poetry. But most of the history of the world, most literature was poetry. So to the end of the world of literature, you have to take a step back from the Kardashian-Trump world to a world where literature matters. To appreciate poetry, you have to take two steps back. And I found that book very useful in getting students who don't read for the most part. And if they do read novels to say, hey, here's some poetry that works. There are dozens of poems in that book that I have found college students in the last seven years that they said, oh, I don't like poetry, but I like this. Nice. So then I taught a high school creative writing class and I used three textbooks. This was 2019, 2018, 2019 school year, I think. And so it was the Herman Melville Centennial. So that's all I'm going to use Moby Dick. And then I used a book called Sleeping on the Wing, which is an anthology for high school students that Ken Koch put together with writing exercises. And then I used ABC of Reading. At the end of the year, for the first time ever, I had a group of kids reading Pound and they said, yeah, this worked. I tried to use ABC of Reading before it hadn't. But starting with the Koch book, to get them familiar with sort of this post-Poundian, more much more low-key approach to literature, and then seeing how Pound was so nuts and bolts and so practical about learning how to write better. I found that that worked well in that class, although it was a heartbreaking class in another regard, in that we had read Moby Dick and nobody had complained about Moby Dick the whole year. It was my fourth time teaching Moby Dick. The other times I taught it, people complained and complained about how boring it was. So I I was kidding myself that it was working. At the end of the year, I had them write essays. Do you think this book was worth your time? And they all said, no, it was not worth my time. But they'd all improved so much as writers over the year that their essays were really good about why they thought this book was a waste of their time. <laughs> And so it made me question myself as an educator, reading these really well-written essays about why they didn't think Moby Dick was worthwhile anymore. Eh, seemed to work. They, they, they'll realize it later on. I think I, I had maybe. A, I think I had a semi-classical education. I got a lot of Shakespeare. I don't remember what else. And uh, boy, I thought I remember we we read that. Uh, Gabriel, whatever, Marquez, A Thousand Days of Solitude. Or, and I just mm-hmm. couldn't understand what the hell I was reading at all. And, uh, but I look back and I'm kind of glad I got it. I, I got exposed to it, at least. For my a college class, I used to teach a Western novel called Warlock. I taught it like two or three times. And one of the students said, this book reminds me why I hate reading. It's good, but you have to work hard. Ah, uh, and that's weird because that's that's what E. Cummings said about Pound. He said, "You, you damn sadist! You want to make your readers work or think." I remember. Uh, I've just kind of Wilson re- recommended Faulkner, and I read a little Faulkner, and I enjoyed it, but it was a lot of work. So, for those of us that can't comprehend all this. Mm-hmm. What is what is Wilson's interest in Pound? It seems I noticed in that that brain books list I was just mm-hmm. quoting from earlier. He has Ulysses first, Pound Canto second, and Korzybski third. That seems significant. What's and I remember when that magazine came out in the nineties, a lot of Wilson heads were surprised because sometimes Wilson put Finnegan's Wake so far beyond Ulysses. And so a lot of people were rather a lot of Wilson's were sort of dismissive of Ulysses saying, Ulysses is number one, you know, oh my God, because he, he always talked about Finnegan's weight so much. 
Mm. One thing that strikes me thinking about Pound over the last month since you mentioned you want to do this interview, Pound permeates Wilson's thought. Mm. Wilson kept going back to Pound over and over again for more than 50 years so that he shaped so many different ideas in in Wilson, attitudes about history, about education, about writing, about economics, et cetera, magic, love. So, you know, it's one of those things that, you know, there's some writers that you come to, and and, and for me too, I mean, last 40 years, Pound has had such a, a huge impact on me. I can't separate him from the rest of my life in some ways. Many writers that Wilson got into as a young person came from him hearing them bad mouthed. Right. So again, this is like right after World War II, Pound's accused of treason. He is blacklisted. Wilson read the poem, The Ballad of the Goodly Fair, which I recommend everyone look up. It's a very comprehensible poem that Jesus wrote about. Or sorry, that Pound wrote about Jesus. Beautiful, rhyming poem. And Pound even made the observation, if I kept writing poetry like this, I could be a success. I could just keep doing this and become a popular Christian poet. Okay, it's a terrific piece. And I remember Bob reciting that poem from memory wow. at a friend's house in 88. Pound and Bob had a very good memory. Yeah. And so Pound, Bob, Bob kept going to Pound and reading him and getting more and more and more and more out of it. And again... Bob was not someone to be put off. He just sort of accepted that people are flawed and he just kept digging. Okay. Uh, And he found that there was so much there in Pound that touched on everything that he was interested in. So you see little bits of Pound showing up in his early writing, showing up in uh, um, sex and drugs. Okay. Because you got Pound's attitudes about. Uh, the troubadours uh, very much shaped Bob's ideas about the history of the hidden tantric traditions in European occultism. Okay, you definitely have hints of throughout Pound. Um, this huh. is a hint that maybe maybe Pound did pranayama every day. Uh, certainly, Pound had this real strong idea of this sort of erotic energy running through, running through the rest of European tradition. Then. Pound is interested in some wild economic ideas, which Wilson became more and more interested in. And the idea that even if you think, you know, again, Pound's acceptance of Mussolini seems crazy, but Pound very much saw, you know, he was using Douglas. And Douglas wrote about how when the interest rates go up, suicide rates go up and how much money affects perception. Um Also, just from a practical point of view, Pound has a lot of practical stuff to help people be better writers. I talked to both Allen Ginsberg and Robert Creeley about how much they learned to be writers from reading ABC of Reading. You know, Ernest Hemingway said, I learned more about writing from Pound than I did from anybody else. Hmm. And so I think as Wilson's going through trying to make himself into a successful writer, even though You know, he tried to write poetry as a young person. He wrote little bits of poetry, but a lot of the practical advice on writing that suffuses Pound's writing shapes how Wilson did. Somewhere or another, there's an interview where Pound says when it comes, I'm sorry, Wilson says in terms of style, he learned more from Ezra than anybody else. Well, so just an enormous amount of influence. What were some of the economic ideas? Can you go into detail there? And again, I and this what uh, uh, Tim Leary loved the idea TFYQA. Think for yourself and question authority. Right. Just you know this, but other people may not. 2004, 2005, 2006. I used to be really big into letting my students choose their textbooks. So I was teaching 10th grade honors, and I said I want to do something by pound this year. We I gave them like a list of six different things we could do. They said, Hey, let's do the big one. Let's do the Cantos. And so I said, okay. I worked so hard trying to teach that to them. It studied so much. I was so exhausted. I said, I'll never do this again. Next year, I gave the kids the choice. They chose the candles again. I did it again. Did it three years in a row. I I said, never again. I've never done it since then. So at that time, I was like spending every spare minute I had trying to understand Pound well well enough to answer 10th graders' questions about it. Okay. Uh, 
but that was 16 years ago. <laughs> so again, I, I used to have a fair grasp. Uh, what's also interesting, if you look at those readings that Pound gave, that Bob Wilson gave us in the 90s and early 2000s, he put a bunch of these books on there that are similar to Pound's. So he's got like um, Benjamin Tucker instead of a book uh, by mm-hmm. Man Too Busy to Write One. Uh, Silvio Gazelle's um, The New Economic Order. Yeah. Henry George, uh, Progress from Poverty. Um, certainly Silvio Gazelle and uh, uh, it was a big influence on on Ezra. But and it's interesting, I was watching your maybe logs with all the guys on last yeah. July and talking about the economic, you know, what happens in our modern world. The idea that and, and Bob Wilson wrote about this in different ways than Pound, but this, you know, the idea of what went wrong in our civilization, what areas, and so the idea that. You know, uh, avarice, as Pound said, came to shake things. Pound looked at when banks started running economies rather than governments. We ran into some problems. So for Pound and for Wilson, I believe 1694 is an important date when the Bank of England starts controlling the economy rather than the government. Because the idea is people didn't trust governments and said, well, let's try banks. Of course, that didn't work out well. Um Looking at a Pound was fascinated at American history, I find it interesting that he hated Alexander Hamilton and saw Hamilton as being very, very pro-bank. So it's interesting in the last years, the popularity of the Broadway show Hamilton, Hamilton has become a hero to some people, which a number of historians said is sort of weird that Hamilton was so pro-banker. Uh and it's interesting, Ishmael Reed wrote a play really attacking the, the, the show Hamilton. But uh, Pound liked people like Silvio Gazelle. Silvio Gazelle thought that there should be, uh, you know, fees charged for hoarding money. Uh, Pound was really influenced by Benjamin Tucker. He was friends with Bucky Fuller. There, there, there's a book that I really liked uh, called The Candidates of Pound by, who wrote it? Uh <laughs> I'm forgetting these. I'm going to pull up my screen here so I can tell you because it's, it's. I'm just thinking out loud here, but that helps when you talk about Tucker and Gazelle and George. That that's that's those are kind of poundy and influenced. Yeah, Peter Macon. Yeah, Peter Macon is a pound scholar. He may even still be alive. Because part of the challenge is that really great generation of pound scholars died off. Robert Anton Wilson, Hugh Kenner, Carol Terrence, etc. But Peter Macon wrote a really good book called The Cattles of Ezra Pound, and he put together a book of essays called The Casebook. And he, I think he'd be a good place to go to. Um, Pound wrote a short book called The ABC of Economics, but it's a pretty tough go. It's, you know, ABC, but it's often a, sort of a, a tough case. Um, but basically, he did not like the banking system and the monopoly capitalism. And this is where, unfortunately, it gets mixed with anti-Jewish banking tropes. And this oh. is where after you talk about the Rothschilds and the Cantos, I say, no, no, Ezra. Right. I, I Yeah, I see where that rabbit hole goes. Um, and, but again, realize he's born in 1885. And, and again, one of the miracles of Joyce is that Joyce did not seem touched at all by this anti-Semitism. Although you see some of his personal remarks, he would make jokes about money and bankers and stuff. But... I remember talking to Bob Wilson once that you can read Ulysses as if it were written after World War II. It's a commentary on the Holocaust about the horrible stupidity of anti-Semitism, even though that book came out in 1922. Wow. So what would you want to say about Pound as you've processed all this since I've asked you about the interview? I don't know. <laughs> Just, you know, it, it, both I mean, it's interesting if you look at pound and bob wilson after the age of 60 i think they both got wiser and they both lost a lot of their certainty huh. okay pound was broken by it bob was not but he would have moments i remember he wrote me a letter once in the 90s where he talked about what a failure he was as a writer OK, because, you know, he's just had struggling economically, whatatever. You know, I, I wrote back saying, no, no, I love your writing. You're a wonderful writer. But, you know, it's it's interesting that you've got the rare times I dislike Bob Wilson's writing. It's, it's sometimes when he's young and he's being sort of smarmy and self-righteous. He loses that almost totally by the time you get to his late writing. And so he's rarely going to be nasty to anybody. 
uh, just that incredible good nature, hilaritas, yeah, okay? cheerfulness, and that goes back to the story. Um, who was it? it was Gaveston Plethon, who was a medieval philosopher who wrote that sometimes in Greek mythology the gods pretend to be human. You can tell it's a god pretending to be human by their amor et hilaritas, their love and cheerfulness. Yeah, cheer- and I think Bob learned that from Pound because it shows up in Pound a number of different times. It's interesting. Pound was fascinated by um, Sigismondo Malatesta, who, when he built the Tempio of Malatesta in Rimini, Italy, he brought the ashes of Gemiston Plethon to put into the temple. What's the meaning of that? And so, they, what's that? What's and the meaning Plethon of that? We talked about that. Amore hilaritas, love and uh, cheerfulness. That comes from Gemaris and Plethon. And so Sigismund O'Malley, and it's interesting, if you read Bob Wilson's uh, the, uh, the Earth Will Shake, he, uh, Sigismund o goes to visit the Tempio Malatest in Rimini. Early in the Cantos, Pound has a section on Sigismund O'Malley. And for Pound, and I think it's very interesting in this internet age, the historical record is very mixed about Sigismund of Malatesta. He lived in the middle of the 15th century. He was a successful general and a noble. And so he was a general for hire. But what was weird about him was that he did not want to hang out with other rich people. He wanted to hang out with artists. And he used his money to build a temple in Rimini. It's supposedly a temple of St. Francis, but it's full of pagan imagery and images of his mistress. And so this is where some people say, no, he was really a secret pagan and he's making a pagan temple in Renaissance Italy. Um, And uh, what's interesting about him, though, is that the Pope hated him. He's the only person in the history of the Catholic Church who has been canonized as a saint of hell. He was accused by the Pope of necrophilia and all sorts of crimes. Later, he was champ- seen as a proto-Protestant for his opposing the power of the papacy. And when Pound wrote those cantos, which is in the 20s, I think, the historical record was mixed. We didn't know who was telling the truth. Was he a horrible necrophiliast or was he a great patron of the arts? And so I used to, and I bet you could still do this. I would go into Barnes and Noble and go to the Italy section on the travel books. Half the travel books on Italy don't mention Rimini. All of those that do mention the Tempio Malatesta. Half of those talk about him as evil, horrible criminal from the Renaissance. The other talk about him <laughs> as a great champion of the arts. So what's cool is, again, Pounds, is, and one of the reasons that Bob Wilson loved Pound so much, Pound wanted you to think for yourself and reach your own conclusions. For however fucked up Pound was at his semitism, anti-Semitism and his hatred, he wanted to make the reader think and learn things for themselves. So this is one of his fascinations with Sigismundo Malatesta. And again, this is where uh, Sigismundo Malatesta brought the ashes of Gemist on Plethon, who wrote about Amor Hilaritas. So here we are on the Hilaritas podcast, in part because Sigismundo was fascinated by Gamiston Plethon, Pound was fascinated by Sigismundo Baltesta, uh, Wilson was obsessed with Pound. And so Wilson through ah, boy, what am I trying to say? A lot of his writing was kind of that take you down the rabbit hole and then pull the carpet out from under you and make you question everything. And what I'm getting is that this is a Poundian thing. Is that fair? Yeah, absolutely. And you can also say that's a Crowley thing. That's a Joyce thing. Okay. Okay. Even though Pound and Crowley would lecture you and tell you what you're supposed to do, what you're supposed to think, then on the other hand, they would say, no, think for yourself, schmuck. Joyce didn't want to lecture anybody. Right. Okay. Wow. So, okay, I'm really uh, just kind of taking in what a deep influence this all is on Wilson in terms of writing style, in terms of like these big picture meta philosophical discussions and and things. And um, it's more than just a hierarchy of values. Yeah. And and again, back in 85, I went to the Ezra Pound Centennial. 
and I, I, I got to talk with Ginsburg and Creeley and Don Hall and Pound's daughter, Pound's mistress, a whole bunch of people, Hugh Cantor. And I asked, they had a panel of poets. I said, you know, you talk about as young men, you, you learn to write from reading Pound. What do you, and Ginsburg and Creeley were both 59 at that point. I said, what, what does he mean to you now? And Bob Creeley said, to be men, not destroyers, which comes to the very end of the cantos. And I think that's that's Bob Wilson's to a T. To be men, not destroyers. Not, yeah. Wow. Say more about that uh, around, uh, for Bob Wilson. What does that mean? To, to make the world a better place. You yeah. know, uh, it, it, it's interesting. The, he, when he talks about reading the cantos to the last page, the last page has changed because they're different editions of the cantos. <laughs> and Pound didn't finish the cantos. Um, Bob Wilson talked about in 1968, he had lunch at the Playboy Club with William Burroughs and Alan Ginzer before they all got tear gassed by the cops. And they commented that it was really appropriate that the great epic of the 20th century ends in fragments. Okay, that Pound could not bring himself to finish the poem. And Don Hall really helped Pound to shape it, shape, shape that last volume, which was called Drafts and Fragments. But the original version, the version I first read of the Cantos, ended with Canto 120. Since then, they've changed, so the new edition ends with that line, to be men, not destroyers. But the original ending, and again, and Pound scholars argue what Pound wanted, but the old Canto 120 was, I have tried to write paradise. Do not move. Let the wind speak. That is paradise. Let the gods forgive what I have made. Let those I love try to forgive what I have made. And for me, that seems like such a Taoist poem from somebody who hated Taoism. And of course, Bob, at the end of his life, moved to such a Taoist headspace. So that be men, not destroyers, when you started to speak about that, it brought up uh, Bucky Fuller's living re and not killing re. It's interesting how all these people tie together in, in some way or another. All these people, I mean, uh, this group of the tale of the tribe that he, and the brain books um, that he credits as influencers um, or the major yeah, influencers. And Bucky gets mentioned in the cantos. Really? And Bucky is another one where people are now debunking him and saying all these nasty things about him. And I sort of wonder what Bob would have made of it because Bob was so good at seeing the good side of people. Yeah. Well, it's, I mean, boy, there's so much to unpack there because I think to have an original and unique uh, position on something today is is to set you up for attack by somebody. There's a lot of haters out there. Certainly, as we've done these podcasts and we've covered different people, I've I've got oh, like there's there's kind of a dark, not a dark side, but he was kind of like a failed entrepreneur for most of his life. That was a little shocking, I guess. Right, Bob puts him on such a pedestal, and then you find out there's so much more to it. But at the same time, it's like Bob was able to take what was important, I think, and highlight that. And sometimes that left you with the impression this person was like godlike, or not godlike, but you know exalted status and you're, you're oh they're just human like everyone else and, and the, the god like these what in the late cantos a number of times pound is talking about his vision and he says it coheres although i cannot make it cohere i am not a demigod so basically pound saw his limitations as a writer that he wanted to he, originally he wanted to have a infernal purgatorial paradiso like dante of the modern world right. but he felt he could not make his paradise cohere OK. And so he thought and it's interesting. He, he wrote a beautiful, beautiful obituary for T.S. Eliot. Uh, and, you know, it, again, this is during his silence. It's one of the most beautiful things Pound wrote. And he said, um, you know, his was the true Dante-esque voice. You know, what can I say with the urgency of 50 years ago? Read him. So, again, that unselfishness and Pound acknowledging that maybe Eliot had that demigod quality that that he himself didn't have, that he could not make his final poetry cohere. I like that in a way, though. It's like, to the extent that we talk about 
the ineffable as unable to be described, and uh, he struggles to describe it. And, 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 and it gets, it's interesting to see these little Poundian threads that run through uh, Illuminatus, um, that when Hagbard steps aside, he quotes the line from Dante in Italian that is quoted by uh, Pound. It's, you, know, you know, have you been through hell in a boat yet? Um, and, uh, you know, the, the Pound's sense of humor, I think, also informs Wilson's sense of humor. There's a wonderful line near the end of the cantos where he says, you know, I'm going to have to study some Greek to be able to write this thing, but you're going to have to study some Greek too. You know, he's talking to the reader saying, yeah, we're going to have to work. And well, one of the things I think about, I, I, I love Duolingo. And I wonder what Pound would have thought of Duolingo that, you know, he's got lots of little bits of lots of different languages in the cantos. And if I work through my Duolingo Greek, I can at least sound out some of the words in the Greek characters. Mm. And, you know, you know, when it comes to the Chinese, I, I used to do the Duolingo Chinese every day. And and I saw, but but I, I know I do it's a horrible job sounding out the Chinese and the cantos. Uh, that was what was interesting for me during the pandemic. I was teaching some classes in China over the computer. No, oh, wow. Um, and uh, it was, you know, I, I felt good when I got to the point where this kid stopped laughing at me when I tried to say something in Chinese. You know, it used to be that they would just laugh at me that my Chinese accent was so terrible. Uh, I, I never made much progress in Chinese, but I thought it was something where they said, Yeah, I can understand what you're saying. Right. At least you got to the point where you weren't being mocked. Or at least they were more polite about it, yeah. Yeah, they were polite about it. So what haven't I asked you that you want to talk about today? I think about, for years, I thought about the year 1922. Um, Bob Wilson wrote about Pound's postscriptum Ulysses calendar. You know, remember back in the late 1990s, Pound became, a, Wilson became obsessed with uh, calendars. You know, as people were moving to the year 2000, and he, like, Pound started a calendar that started with the year one when Ulysses was published. Right. Bob never mentioned that that was his fascist calendar. That was also the year Mussolini came to power. <laughs> okay, so again, Wilson sees the good. He doesn't talk about the bad. Um, and so, uh, so 1922, Mussolini comes to power. You have major developments in quantum mechanics. Elliot publishes The Wasteland, which is dedicated to Pound, and Pound helped to edit it. And, and this actually, I, I'll close with two things. Uh, going back to your interview with Oz, which I, I think about the ending of that. One. I recommend Street Legal by Rafi Zabor. Terrific book. I know he plugged that with you at the end of his thing. And the second thing, and if you look at what shocked people about the wasteland, it was the transitions or the lack of transitions. If you go back to Aristotle and it's in the French neoclassical critics, there's this idea that works of art should have unities of time, place, and action. Classical Greek plays, if it was a three-hour play, it took place over three hours, characters were going to travel as far as they could go in those three hours. People criticize Shakespeare for not following the unities. And only two of these plays does he do that. He does that in The Tempest, he does it in Comedy of Errors. Most of his plays will cover huge amounts of time. Uh, Anthony and Cleopatra covers years. When you start moving into film in the 1910s, D.W. Griffith starts having these cutting stories being told by cuts. And we're used to that. You and I grew up seeing James Bond films. Well, they'll be in China. Then they'll be in Italy. Then they'll be in New York. Then they'll be in a space satellite. This was so anathema to the world of the 1910s. Mm. And so one of the things that you see in pounds, you start having rapid cut in the cantos. You will cut from ancient Greece to modern America to the Middle Ages in Italy. Elliot did this a bit in the wasteland. And when Pound went through to edit the wasteland, he cut out the transitions. He said, let's make it more radical. You don't have to explain that you're going here. Just cut, cut, cut. Okay. And it's interesting. Joyce scholars talk about Joyce learning this from Eisenstein. But Wilson would emphasize Eisenstein learned it from D.W. Griffith. Okay, so again, Pan and Wilson talked about how Illuminatus was based on uh, uh, intolerance by D.W. Griffith. Um, and so it's interesting to me, uh, 2022, 
a lot of people talked about this is the 100th anniversary of Ulysses. Fewer people talked about it was the 100th anniversary of Mussolini coming to power, 100th anniversary of the Wasteland. We're moving into 2023 when, of course, Monica Lewinsky will turn 50. And it marks the anniversary, <laughs> of, 50th anniversary of Bob's uh, serious experiences. Oh, yeah. So this seems to be like this will be an interesting year for uh, Wilson Studies. As your podcast becomes massively popular, and you have untold financial success with all the problems that that will bring, I know. More money, more problems. Uh, and, and so it, it's interesting to see, you know, how can Ezra help us navigate? So two final things. One, Bob Wilson made the instant observation that you can see the Cantos and Finnegan's Wake as attempts to create the internet on paper. You click on something, you jump from hypertext to hypertext, from page to page. That's what you do when you read the Cantos. Canto one, you've got, it's a passage from ancient Greek, translated into medieval Latin, translated into modern English using a verse form from medieval Middle English. So what Pound did is he went back to what he thought was the oldest part of the oldest poem in Western civilization and gave a history of how we got there in English, according to the Greek tradition, the Latin tradition, the Anglo-Saxon tradition, and the modern American tradition. So by the act of how we got that translation, he gave us this hypertext history of our civilization and of poetry in a few lines. That's what, what, what Pound, what Wilson loved. Uh, and so the idea that you get this idea of the internet being there on paper. Um, and the last thing I was going to say, now I, I've lost it. I should have made a note. Um, but I, I'll, I'll, I'll end with that. Okay. Boy, I don't want to end. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and it's weird. You know, I, 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 when I was getting ready for this, I, I was going back and I said, I don't like Pound. I don't like him. I don't like him. I don't like him. It says, ooh, maybe I should keep reading him after the interview. I should really finish rereading the Cantos. I haven't read it for a long time. Uh, you know, uh, he, he, he does suck you in. It's, it's, it's very much like uh, the Godfather 3. You know, I keep trying to get out. It keeps pulling me back in. <laughs> um, how, so how can Ezra help us today? And there's something about this multi-dimensionality and time-space jumping of the internet. Is that? And, and, and you know, to be people, not destroyers. You know, to to, to move yeah. away his, his sexist language to be men, not destroyers. But uh, I I had a T-shirt that I got at the Pound Centennial. It was Ezra Pound, and it said, "What thou lovest well remains; the rest is dross," which comes from uh, uh, the Peas and Cantos. Wow. I'm uh, also, to... there's this, this. Go ahead. There's a great poem by Basil Bunting that he wrote inside his copy of the Cantos, where he says, "There are the Alps. You have to go a long way around if you want to avoid them." <laughs> so, if you really want to understand Bob Wilson, you got to wrestle with Pound. I think if you really want to understand our civilization, you got to wrestle with Pound. Uh, you know, it's like when you read histories of literature in, in English that ignore Pound, which most of them do, it doesn't cohere so much. But when you put Pound in the mix, you see, oh, that ties in together with Yeats, with Eliot, with Joyce, with E.E. E. Cummings, with D.H. Lawrence, with uh, uh, Ernest Hemingway. Suddenly it all starts to make sense, I, for me at least, and for Bob Wilson, I think. Interesting. Well, maybe we ought to end it because I, I am... Uh brain dead as usual about after an hour so thank you thank you sir that concludes the episode thank you for listening i hope you enjoyed it a big thank you to eric wagner for returning to the show and taking the time to chat thank you to christina pearson of the robert anton wilson trust and richard ross of hilaritas press and thank you to ryan reeves for putting it all together the next regular episode, releasing on the 23rd of April, will feature professional drummer and chaos magician Zach West on probability engineering and the musical circuits. Until then, I am your host, Mike Gathers, signing off with love and cheerfulness. Amor e hilaritas.